Have you ever thought, how do we know so much about the Mauryan Empire? From where do we get so much of information? So there are two sources of history, which are the literary sources and the archaeological sources. So what are the literary sources? Literary sources are anything that you find in the written form. And archaeological sources are anything that you find like monuments, like buildings, like rocks, like pillars. So these are the archaeological sources. These serve as the history bricks which we join together to find any information, to reconstruct the past. Now one of the major literary source that we have about the modern empire is the Indica. And Indica was written by Megasthenes. Now who was Megasthenes? He was a Greek ambassador who was sent to the court of Chandragupta Maurya by Seleucus. So he was sent to the court of Chandragupta Maurya by Seleucus Nicator. Now what do you find in the Indica? So in Indica we have many things about whatever Megasthenes observed during his stay in the court of Chandragupta Maurya like the life of people, like the society, the polity, the administration and many other things. So Indica in short gives us much information about how the society was, about how the administration was, about how the people used to live, about how the empire was to be governed. So it mainly had the observations which was made by Megasthenes about the court of Chandragupta Maurya. It also had details about Patliput which was the capital city at that time. So it had many things related to about how the government in Patliputra was, about how the city of Patliputra was beautifully built. So he was very enthralled by the beauty of Patliputra. So he mentioned many things about Patliputra and the government of the Mauryan Empire at that time in Indica. Another major source from which we get to know about Mauryan Empire is the Arthashastra. Now Arthashastra was written by Kautilya and this is the last surviving original manuscript which we find at the Oriental Research Institute and where is this located? It is at Mysuru. Now Arthashastra it was completed by the 2nd century BC till 3rd century BC and it was in use till the 12th century but after that it was temporarily lost. But again what happened it was rediscovered by R. Shamasastri when in 1905 and was published in 1909. So what do we get to know from the Arthashastra? So Arthashastra was divided into 15 adhikarans or books which had total of 50 chapters relating to 180 subjects and this in total comprised of about 6000 shlokas or the verses. Now as you can see there were 15 adhikarans you can look over here also among which book number 2 was the lengthiest of all and book number 11 was the shortest of all. Now according to Patrick Oliville who was a scholar of Sanskrit language. The Hindu texts were organized in conventional numbers like 15, 18 and the like. Now what do we get to know from Arthashastra? From this book we get to know about administration, criminal and civil laws, ethics, strategies of the military. Then we also get to know about the espionage system and other aspects that the king must be mindful of. This book Arthashastra was written in Sanskrit. However, one must be mindful that whatever is written in this book may not have been the reality of past because it represents an ideal situation. So historians have to be very careful when dealing with Arthashastra. Now can you tell me Arthashastra was written by Megasthenes. Is it true or false? Yes, it's false. So. Arthashastra was written by Kautilya or Chanakya. Now let us come to the archaeological sources of history. What are the archaeological sources of history? As I have already mentioned, it, are, it is like something buildings, monuments, rocks, pillars, things like that. So here that we have the edicts. 
what are edicts edicts are the rocks and pillars on which we have the messages engraved upon it what messages the messages from the emperor messages from ashoka mainly so it has messages inscribed on the surface of rock pillars and caves now what you find here is the ashokan edict and what was ashokan edict used for it was used to spread the ideals of dhamma and buddhism to whom obviously to the subjects it also help us to understand the extent of ashoka's empire how far was it extended now you see here these are some example of the rock edicts the rock edicts from kalsi in uttarakhand and the elephant shaped rock edict at dholi now this elephant shaped rock edict at dholi is one of the most important in orissa because it is the earliest rock edict earliest type of sculpture that you find in orissa and one of the earliest also found in india and one important speciality about this rock edict at dholi is that it is found at dholi and where is dholi it is located exactly where the war of kalinga was fought so it also talks about how ashoka as an emperor transformed from a ruthless emperor to a father like figure the ashokan edicts were divided into three categories the major rock edicts the minor rock edicts and the pillar edicts now the language that was used to compose these edicts was prakrit language as it was the language of the people so having the messages written in prakrit language allowed the messages to be spread to a larger population now the language that was used was prakrit but the script differed from place to place so as to suit the needs of the people like in the central region most of the people understood the brahmi script and sometimes they also understood the kharoshthi script so this script was used so that the most of the people could understand it properly so here you see the inscription in brahmi script on the lion pillar at sarnath Now here you see the Kandahar rock edict inscribed in Greek. So there were also people in the Mauryan Empire who also understood many other different scripts. So the scripts that were used were Greek, Aramaic, Greco-Aramaic script. Okay, and where was this found? On the northwest frontier regions like Kandahar, Lagman, and Takshila. So now can you tell me why this kind of bilingual form was there? Because there were people who understood the main language that is pali and prakrit as well and there were people who also understood greek aramaic greco aramaic so you can say that the extent of ashoka's empire was huge it had people of different cultures now let us understand what is the significance of some of the rock edicts that we find so what does the minor rock edict one help us with it is at located at maski and helps us to connect that the title devanam piya or beloved of the gods was assumed by ashoka so before this we did not know that devanam piya was ashoka himself but with the help of this we can connect that the title devanam piya or the beloved of the gods was assumed by ashoka Now the minor rock edict 3 it gives us a list of mysterious buddhist scriptures that the buddhist monks had to read on a daily basis The Baravar cave inscription what did it help us with it helped us to understand the propagation of the idea of the religious tolerance so the messages that were inscribed on the Baravar cave were to propagate the idea of religious tolerance and the last is the queen's edict now what does the queen's edict tell us about it tells us about the donations that were made by ashoka's wife the queen to whom to the buddhist sangha now we have already understood the significance of the minor rock edict now what was the significance of the major rock edicts let us see so the major rock edicts help us to understand 
Ashoka's royal orders, moral virtues and political considerations. But they shed only a little light on the personal life of Ashoka. Now let us see the significance of some of the major rock edicts. Like the major rock edict 4, 5 and 7 talks about the importance of Dhamma and Dhamma Gosha or the conquest through moral law over Bheri Gosha or the violent territorial conquest. So as you already know Ashoka gave up on Bheri Gosha or the territorial conquest and instead took up Dhamma or Dhamma Gosha that is conquest through the spread of moral laws of Dhamma. It also tells us about Ashoka's concern for the treatment of all subjects including slaves and the importance of religious tolerance. So it tells us that Ashoka was very much concerned that all his subjects were treated equally and people had religious tolerance in them. Now the major rock edict 2 gives an idea of the territorial extent of Ashoka's empire suggesting that Ashoka had neighbors like the Cheras, Cholas, Pandyas, Satyapuras and the Greek king Antiochus II. The major rock edict 13 is composed in Ashoka's 8th regnal year and talks about the famous battle of Kalinga which was fought in the year 261 BCE after which Ashoka transformed from a ruthless ruler to a fatherly emperor. Now coming to the pillar inscriptions. Now the Pillar Edict 7 talks about the welfare of the public while the Pillar Edict 5 that you see here talks about the direction of Ashoka to his people to adopt a policy of non-injury to animals so as to protect the animals and other living beings. So what did it do? It prevented the killing of certain animals on special days of the month. So there were particular days of the month that were devoted to that no animals would be killed. It also talks about setting up of medical facilities for animals and travelers. Now here you see the pillar edict from Lauria Araraj in Bihar and one you have from the Delhi Topra pillar edict. Now a very interesting story revolves around this Delhi Topra pillar edict. So Firoz Shah Tughlaq of the Tughlaq dynasty was very much enthralled to see such a spectacular pillar inscription. So what did he do? He moved this pillar from his, its original place and shifted it to Firozabad as totemic embellishment. So you see this Delhi Topra pillar edict which originally was somewhere in Haryana is now shifted to Delhi. Now Ashoka's officials would travel around the empire and even read out the messages to the people ensuring that even the illiterate masses of the people would follow the path of Dhamma. So this is how Ashoka made sure that the illiterate people who could not read the inscriptions could also understand what his ideals were and could follow it in their real life. So now here you see the extent of all the places where the Ashokan edicts are placed. Like you see Girnar, Sopara, Sannathi, Jogara, Dholi, Araraj, Kosambi and many others. Now coming to the stupas. Stupas have a very interesting history. There is a mythology that revolves around Ashoka which says that he broke 8 out of the 10 original stupas and distributed the hidden relics and built 84,000 stupas across his empire. So here you see there we have the Behrut stupa, Amravati stupa and the Dhamik stupa. Now what was the use of this stupa? The significance of this stupas was that it provided a mode of worshipping Buddha and to be in presence of his mortal remains. So it was very significant to the Buddhist laity. The Sanchi stupa is the oldest stupa that is built by Ashoka when in the 3rd century BCE. The spherical dome was built by Ashoka but the stone encasement was done by the later rulers.
Now, can you tell me why there were so many carvings on the stupas? Why was it not just in the written form and carvings were given? Can you tell me? So, many of the Buddhist monks did not know how to read. So, for them, understanding the pictorial representation was the only means of understanding the life of Buddha and how Ashoka was involved into Buddhism. So, here you see there is a carving which shows the pilgrims visiting the Sanchi Stupa. And here you see there is a carving from the Sanchi Stupa gateway which shows that Ashoka visited the Ramagrama Stupa. So, here you see this probably is the picture of a king because he is on a chariot. So, he used to visit certain stupas and here what we have is his visit to the Ramagrama stupa. So, now we already know what the literary sources are and what the archaeological sources are and how does it help us to solve the puzzle of the past. So, we saw how Indika and how Arthashastra explained us about the governance, about how the society at that time was, about how the state used to administrate. We also see how there were messages engraved on the rocks and pillars which were used to spread the moral law of Dhamma. So, here also you see the Ashokan major and minor rock edicts, pillar and stupas. You also saw how the illiterate masses got to know about the messages because there were people who used to read it out to them. We also saw how there were stupas, how there were carvings of the stupas because the Buddhist monk could not understand what was written. So, for them pictorial representation was made. So, you see how we get to know so much about the Mauryan empire from these literary and the archaeological sources. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app and get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology, get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly. Learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it is rewarding too. So register for free now.